and I have a double-sided page. It's important to note that the, that the Culling Commission is independent of government. And as I mentioned earlier in the lockup, I want to acknowledge the technical and logistical events and media relations support provided by the province in Vancouver and Victoria for this session with Commissioner Cullen. When we move into the Q&A with Commissioner Cullen, those of you on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. And if you're in the room, please approach the mic. We want to get as many questions as possible in today. So we're limiting it to one question and one follow up. Now, I'm going to leave it to Commissioner Cullen to make his opening remarks, and then we'll open it up to questions. This is on. Can you hear me all right? Thank you. Um, thank you, Ruth. Uh, since I uh, being announced in May of 2019, the Commission team has held five community meetings around the province, undertaken thousands of hours of investigation, research and interviews, held 143 hearing sessions, over 138 hearing days, heard testimony from 199 witnesses with an additional 23 witnesses providing evidence via sworn affidavit and received 1,063 exhibits. In December of 2020, I uh, released my interim report. As with most uh, public inquiries, the Commission was established in the wake of significant public concern about its subject matter, in this case, the nature and extent of money laundering in British Columbia. The issue was initially brought to the forefront by a watchful press, which was aided in its efforts by individuals whose occupations confronted them with evidence of widespread money laundering in certain sectors of the economy. For the past three years, I've served as the commissioner for this public inquiry that was mandated to look into this challenging problem of money laundering in British Columbia. Our mandate included a sector-by-sector -sector analysis of the growth, evolution, and methods of money laundering, the acts or omissions of those responsible to regulate those sectors that contributed to money laundering, the effectiveness of the anti-money laundering eff efforts of the regulators, and the barriers that have, have inhibited effective law enforcement. My final report is now being released to the public. I hope that today will mark a turning point for the way that governments deal with money laundering in this province. Money laundering is fundamentally destabilizing to the society and the economy that we all want for the province. It allows criminals and bad actors to exploit the very things that we value, stability, sound financial and professional institutions, and personal privacy. Sophisticated money launderers have used British Columbia as a clearinghouse or a terminus uh, for uh, laundering an astounding amount of dirty money. Even though we cannot accurately put a dollar figure on the volume of money laundering that takes place, I conclude in my report that it is a vast amount. While much of this activity has occurred covertly, in the shadows, some has happened in plain sight. In the lead up to this commission, concern was raised in the public discourse about the lack of response to what happened, uh, sorry, to what appeared on its face to be highly su suspicious funds being used and laundered in th this province. Those suspicions were correct and it was right to be in alarmed by this activity and the lack of meaningful response to it. For too long, money laundering has been kept on the sidelines for police, for law enforcement, for regulators, and for governments. Money laundering activity has been and remains to be poorly understood, even by some of the public bodies that need to address it. And money laundering has rarely been given priority uh, too often, it has been largely ignored.
it's time for that to change. My report puts forward 101 recommendations directed primarily to the provincial government and provincial agencies. Those recommendations range from broad overarching changes to quite specific reforms required of particular agencies. The recommendations, if implemented, will begin to address in a serious way a problem that has grown through decades of inaction and ineffectiveness. The report is more than 1,800 pages long. It sets out my findings of fact after lengthy public hearings and my analysis of complex policy issues and practical questions. I have tried to make recommendations that are based on the best possible standards and that are supported by rigorous analysis, but that are also rooted in real-world practicality. Government, law enforcement and regulators will need to be focused and committed to change if we are to see a serious and effective response to money laundering. The report is long, but the executive summary is a far more accessible document at just over 30 pages. Following the executive summary, I have set out in one place all of the 101 recommendations which I make. I'm not going to stand here or sit here and spend hours reviewing all the recommendations and key findings. They've been made public. They speak for themselves but I do want to highlight a few key items. First of all, I recommended the creation of an entirely new office to deal with money laundering. This will be an office of the legislature with a status that will permit independence from the uh, government of the day. I refer to the head of this office as the anti-money laundering commissioner. This is a different kind of commissioner than I have been and is more analogous to the Human Rights Commissioner uh, in terms of form, of course, not, not function. The AML Commissioner will provide permanent strategic oversight of how the province responds to money laundering. The Commissioner will be focused exclusively on money laundering and will provide advice and recommendations to government, law enforcement and regulatory bodies on money laundering issues. The office will monitor, review, audit and report on the performance of provincial entities with a money laundering mandate. It will lead working groups and cooperative efforts to address money laundering issues. I want to be clear here, the AML Commissioner's role would be distinct and different than the role I have had as Commissioner of this inquiry and I am not the person who will fill it should government decide to undertake this recommendation. I also recommend the creation of a new dedicated provincial intelligence and investigation unit, a new policing unit that will lead the law enforcement response to proceeds of crime and money laundering in this province. It will uh, identify, investigate and disrupt sophisticated money laundering and it will train and support other investigators and police agencies in their investigations of money laundering and proceeds of crime cases. The kind of unit I recommend will be a high-end and specialized unit, one that has significant expertise and that is structured quite differently than traditional police units. It will be akin to, but not precisely the same as, the IPOC unit uh, um, that uh, formed part of the RCMP until 2012. The costs of this new unit uh, should be offset by a renewed fo uh, focus on targeting illicit assets for forfeiture. Assets seized by law enforcement bodies in this jurisdiction have been relatively anemic. Uh, we've seen a high of $19.6 million in 2010-2011 to a low of $2.9 million in 2018-2019. These amounts are simply not commensurate with the amounts which are laundered annually in British Columbia 
nor with the amount seized in comparable jurisdictions. New Zealand, for example, has a similar population and GDP to British Columbia, but has achieved much greater success at identifying and seizing or restraining illicit funds. In uh, New Zealand's case, uh, in a comparable, not precisely the same, but comparable period of time, they seized $358 million uh, in Canadian funds, of which 56% was said to be money laundering. I have accordingly made a number of recommendations respecting criminal and civil asset forfeiture, including in the civil asset for forfeiture realm that the province uh, proceed with its plan, which pre predated the establishment of this commission, uh, to implement an unexplained wealth order regime. In many specific areas, I have made recommendations for regulators, public bodies, and government. In these brief remarks, I have identified only a few of the recommendations which I have made to abate the money laundering problem in British Columbia. And uh, I have already noted that my report includes 101 recommendations that are designed to address the manifold aspects of this area of criminal profiteering. I am hopeful that armed with the available tools, the provincial government can successfully take on those who would attempt to corrupt the institutions which British Columbians rely on to serve a coherent and fair social order. As I conclude what has proven to be a challenging but important task, I want to extend my thanks to the participants uh, in the a commission of inquiry and particularly to my team who have worked so hard to complete the lengthy hearings uh, during a pandemic. Uh, I also uh, want to thank the people of this province uh, who have been concerned and supported our work. We have done our work in order to serve the public interest. The commission was created by the provincial government but it is entirely independent of the provincial government. We have gone about our work independently and I am happy to report that the province has consistently respected our independence. This report represents my thinking, not the provincial governments, nor the federal governments, nor anyone else's. It is my analysis and the analysis of my team of first class lawyers and my recommendations for reform. My aim is to offer advice that is realistic, practical and effective. There are reasons for optimism because a new prioritization and support for anti-money laundering will mean that our province can make headway in combating this social ill. Thank you all for being here. We have half an hour for questions and they will be moderated. I look forward to attempting to answer your questions and providing additional context and information regarding my report in answer to those questions. Thank you very much. Uh, to media in the room, if you have a question, please come and queue behind me at the microphone. And media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue for the opportunity to ask a question and a follow up. Our first question today is going to come from John Waugh, Global News. John, please go ahead. Hello, Commissioner. The word unwittingly was once used to describe how casinos were turned into laundromats for dirty money. After this extensive process, how unwitting do you think it was on behalf of government, governing bodies, casinos and law enforcement? Well, I think that's a, a, a very good question. Um, I think the information uh, was there to draw, sorry, the information was there to draw um, different conclusions um, about what was transpiring within the casinos. Um, but as I uh, said in my report, I think there was a failure of will to deal with it. And um, I don't think that equates to uh, deliberate or witting uh, failure to deal with it, but I do think it, it, um, 
it does represent a failure of will. In regards to regulators, um, there was some failures identified with GPEB law enforcement, but particularly BCLC. And we heard evidence during the commission that there was almost this theme of a counter narrative. Um, and you seem to really hit that hard in your report. Um, was there a reason that it seems that BCLC bared most of the brunt when it came to overseeing governing bodies on the responsibility here? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the last part of your question. Yeah, so out of the three, GPEV, law enforcement, and BCLC, um, you spent the most time, especially in your executive summary, talking about how BCLC um, had a lot of information but really did not act on that information. And in evidence, we heard that there was also often, you know, within their own newsletters and discourse that was made available, there was almost a counter narrative of where that money was coming from and why or why not it was not suspicious. Yes, um, yes well, I, I, think, I think that's an accurate characterization of the evidence. Um, um, if you're asking why that was the case, again, I, I return to the theme I expressed earlier. I think there was a, um, a lack of will that, um, that underlay uh, BCLC's um, approach to the, the question. And um, it was um, difficult uh, to, for uh, BCLC to deal with uh, some of the issues they had, um, but, but there could have been more that, that was done at that time to, to deal with the, those issues, in my view. And for the purposes of sight lines, we've changed the microphone to the back of the room here. So we have Renee Filippone, CVC, is next. Thank you. Obviously, this report takes a look back at, at money laundering for a significant period of time. When we talk about money laundering right now, what do we know about who is doing this, domestic, international? Are we still looking at money from China? And what are the primary ways this is being done? Is it still casinos? Is it more primarily real estate? Um, when we're trying to understand, you know, someone needs to be tackling this, where should they be looking? Yeah. Well, I, I think um, that is the reason why I've recommended the, um, the AML commissioner, because that person will, um, will occupy the position of uh, someone who keeps a, a careful eye on what's going on in the world of money laundering in, in the province and be in a position to identify uh, different areas that, that come up. Uh, Peter German in his reper report referred to uh, money laundering as being akin to whack-a-mole and I think that's an apt description. It pops up uh, where you least expect it and there's always, it's always important to be looking at different um, organizations, different uh, ways of, of doing it. Trade-based money laundering is a good example. Well, that appears to be a, a a, a very uh, uh, fruitful source uh, of um, uh, money laundering for some criminal organizations. Yeah, one of the things that um, Commissioner Cullen discusses in the report is the extent to which criminal organizations and professional money launderers are opportunistic and adaptable. And, and, and they, they look for opportunities, they look for weaknesses and, and attempt to exploit them. We saw that in the context of casinos in this province. And it's going to be important for the AML commissioner and enforcement agencies and governments to be alive to the shifting, shifting and opportunistic nature of money laundering if they're going to, to have success in combating it. The report obviously takes a look at the role of FinTrack does or doesn't play in helping these sorts of investigations. Um, how ineffective, in, in your mind, has FinTrack been in the ability, in, in giving the ability for provincial authorities to tackle this? Well, one of the reasons that, um, that we've uh, recommended a, uh, a provincial intelligence gathering and an investigative uh, unit is, is due to the fact that uh, um, FinTrack doesn't appear to be um, effective in getting information back to the province's uh, law enforcement uh, uh, units. Um, the FinTrack gets something in the order of magnitude of 30 million reports a year, uh, but, but gives out um, uh, 25, something in the order of magnitude of 2,500 
uh, reports back to law enforcement, uh, about 350 of which come to British Columbia. So what, what, what we're uh, suggesting is that there is a, a need for uh, much more um, 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 mobile and, and malleable uh, um, enforcement process uh, where intelligence can work with enforcement. Uh, so that's why we've recommended that. Our next question from the room comes from Jeremy Nuttall, The Star. Thank you. Hi, uh, you are fairly, uh, uh, you put a lot of blame, I guess, on, on two federal agencies, that being RCMP and FinTrack. I'm curious if uh, you can tell me if that lack of will which you spoke of also applied to these federal agencies? Um, I'm really um, constrained in what I can say about federal agencies in my report and I've tried to um, ensure that I don't trench on uh, federal jurisdiction because I am a provincially appointed uh, commissioner. Uh, but um, I have looked at the um, at the federal response to money laundering in British Columbia in order to identify uh, some of the gaps in order to make recommendations uh, as to what I think uh, are necessary to fill those gaps. Um, so I, I don't want to get too much into, um, uh, you know, parsing the, the, um, the uh, responses of, of federal agencies. I think I have to be very cautious about that. Did you characterize how cooperative they were in this uh, inquiry? Oh, they were very cooperative. Next question, Kim Boland, Vancouver Sun. Hi, thanks. I have a couple of questions. One is quite specific. You talk about this new investigative and intelligence unit under CFSEU. Would there be embedded prosecutors in this unit? Because one thing I didn't see in my quick, you know, peruse of the executive summary was the fact that we've had a lot of organized crime, money laundering cases where charges have been recommended sometimes late and then later stayed, which is of course a decision of Crown prosecutors. Uh, and where would the officers come from for this unit? We have staffing shortages in policing across the province of up to 30% in some jurisdictions, right? So there's generally a staffing shortage among policing agencies in BC. And my second question is very specifically, you talk about expansion of the role of the Civil Forfeiture Office, but like two years ago we had the BC Supreme Court rule the BC Civil Forfeiture Act as unconstitutional. So while there is an appeal underway of that ruling from two years ago, in the meantime, does it make sense to expand the powers of something that's been ruled unconstitutional? Well, with respect to the civil forfeiture um, question, I, I, I'm not in a position to, to speak in detail about the, the ruling, although I do have some familiarity with it. This is not, it does not address the regime as a whole, but only a specific aspect of it. And the recommendations that um, Commissioner Cullen is making uh, about uh, an expanded operational capacity and, and a, a, a broader reaching focus um, will continue to apply regardless of the outcome of that, that um, proceeding uh, once it ultimately runs it, its course. There is a, Commissioner Cullen identifies a real opportunity um, for an expanded focus um, on the part of the Civil Forfeiture Office, uh, which should have a couple of benefits. One is meaningfully impacting on organized crime and disrupting them in a way that that hits where it really hurts, at their finances. And, and the other is that there will be a trickle-down financial benefit to the province, uh, the contribution to provincial revenue from assets that are uh, forfeit through that expanded focus. You asked um, some questions about the, uh, the nature of the Intelligence and Investigation Unit, and, and you're right, it didn't all make its way into the executive summary. Um, but one of the reasons the Commissioner uh, recommends the structure that he does, does is so that the province has control over um, hiring, staffing, and the ability to ensure the, the funding is dedicated to that unit and those positions are filled. And, and I, I think there's a hope that there will be a focus on hiring individuals with expertise and a true interest in having an enduring 
uh, commitment to, to combating this type of crime and, and that those individuals will be used to staff and, and support this unit as, as it gets underway and, and goes about doing its work. Yeah. And, and, so, yeah, and so far as the prosecutors are concerned, I think what we're uh, recommending is that there be a, a, um, a team of prosecutors that are available uh, to give ongoing advice to the police as they, as they uh, work through their investigations and be in a position to um, conduct a charge approval when, when the, um, the report is, is finished. Okay, thanks. Our next question comes from Frank Chi, Omni. Commissioner, I noticed that in the report you mentioned about China, especially in the casino transaction, but there is no recommendation in, uh, on international cooperation uh, in curbing money laundering, especially with law enforcement in China. I guess it's uh, maybe political, legal, policing system difference, uh, especially concerning uh, the code relation between the two countries now. So uh, could you elaborate more on why uh, there is no recommendation on international cooperation uh, about money laundering? Because if that's a big factor. Yes, I think you raise a, a very good point. Um, basically, the answer is simply that um, that um, the that's a matter that falls within the purview of the federal government, and it falls outside of uh, my uh, my jurisdiction to be able to make recommendations to the federal government about what they should or shouldn't do vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, liaising or or um, engaging in a joint. Um, enterprise with with another government the commissioner does throughout the report though speak to the importance of coordination and cooperation as between governments and a follow-up question about the uh, housing affordability and money laundering issue uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that because uh, when uh, minister eb or when he was not the minister yet he uh, is alleging that the uh, money laundering, uh, especially within the Chinese community, Chinese Canadian community, is a big factor in driving up uh, property price in Vancouver. So, uh, how do you come to the conclusion that there is no illicit, uh, say, link between property price and the money laundering? Well, my my conclusion is a little more nuanced than that, um, but my view after hearing the evidence, particularly from uh, members of CMHC, is that, um, that uh, the uh, causes of the housing uh, unaffordability in the Lower Mainland primarily relates to, um, to um, uh, low interest rates, high demand, and, and low supply. And that's really the driver, in my view, of, of, uh, of uh, high prices in the Lower Mainland. I think if the provincial government were to implement the uh, recommendations which I've made, it, it, they ought not to expect that the issue and the, the very problematic issue of housing unaffordability in the Lower Mainland will be solved by that. Our next question comes from Martin McMahon, City News 1130. Hi, Commissioner. Uh, just a question. Y your, your report touches on the BC Liberal government and some of the actions that it took when it learned about some of these money laundering issues. Based on what you've looked at throughout this whole process, given the information that those ministers had, did the government take reasonable steps at that time, given what those officials knew? I think the government took reasonable steps, but not uh, sufficient steps. I, that may seem a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, contrary to say, put it that way, but they definitely did take steps. Uh, but the steps weren't up to the task of, of uh, abating money laundering in casinos, which was the, the major uh, problem at that time. And I think in, in, the, in report, the word failures is used in is used rather in relation to some of the decisions or the decisions that were not made. 
what was the biggest failure from that, from the government of the day? Well, I want to just um, be clear. The, the report discusses the actions of certain individuals, and it, 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 it's sometimes convenient to use the term government to, to, uh, to apply to those actions. But in the report, the commissioner's discussion is focused on the actions of individuals who held key positions at, at critical times. And, and, and one of the key failings that he identifies is the failure of certain individuals to ensure um, that suspicious funds that were being received weren't contributing to the provincial revenue stream. We have one more question in the room before we go to the phones. We hear from Sam Cooper, Global National. Thanks. Uh, sort of following on that, um, Commissioner Cullen, uh, you pointed spent some time on the IPOC investigation and uh, Barry Baxter's involvement in it and we know from federal evidence that uh, the that the unit said that uh, certain casinos were using foreign nationals as willing pawns in significant money laundering so that's a pretty high level assertion now we have uh, Mr. Baxter going public with some more guarded comments Mr. Coleman reacting to him and you have found well Mr. Coleman essentially rebuking him I think fair so you said Coleman's comments, quote, posed a real risk of misleading the public into believing there was no basis for concern about suspicious transactions in the province casinos at a time when Mr. Coleman had good reason to believe that there was cause to be worried. So my question is, uh, is that not an indication of comments that could have the effect of uh, impeding the will or the direction of the RCMP to, to look into money laundering in BC, indeed possibly Canada? Well, yes, I, I mean, I think, um, I think that's why I identified those comments and, and, um, and made, made my findings in relation to them. Okay, we're going to go to the phone lines next. Uh, from Victoria, we'll hear from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Rob, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Hi, Commissioner. Could you uh, re-summarize for us why... The, you did not find any corruption on the part of uh, officials involved in this, uh, specifically the politicians? Yeah, I can, Rob, thanks for the question. I can sort of point you to some of the Commissioner's findings in that, that regard. He, he's concluded that, well, some officials could have done more um, and, and, and in some cases should have done more. None of those failures were motivated by uh, the hope of personal, financial, political, or, or some other type of gain. So in, in, in short, there, there were failings, but they were not um, motivated by a corrupt purpose. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Sure. Uh, back to the, the Commissioner again. Could you, there is a section here on former Premier Christy Clark and a conclusion that her response, kind of overseeing the government and prioritizing its actions was uh, inadequate and she shares at least some of the the blame for the continuation of, of money laundering in casinos. Could you expand on on that and her role as premier being particularly important and why you, you came to those conclusions? I, I don't think I can expand on that. I think I have to let the report speak for itself. Our next question also from Victoria is from Dirk Meissner, Canadian Press. Dirk, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Commissioner. I also wanted to uh, focus a bit on the, the politicians. Um, in the testimony of uh, former ministers Coleman, Bond, and De Jong, and uh, the former Premier Christy Clark, they all testified that they, they, they knew some sort of suspicious activity was happening at the at casinos. But they all sort of were saying, "Well, there's no smoking gun, so we're just, you know, we'll try something, but we'll let it, we'll let things go as we'll try to make some." Um, help it out or, or fight it somehow, but we'll just try to, it's going to keep going. I'm just wondering what you, th what you feel about all their responses and their actions that they took. Well, I, I don't think that's all that they did. I mean, I think in the case of Mr. Coleman, for example, he engaged uh, Rob Croker to, uh, uh, to look into the uh, issue of uh, money laundering in casinos. In the case of uh, Mr. De Jong, uh, he was responsible for uh, um, setting in motion the, the uh, pieces to get uh, Jigget 
um, established. Um, so, so I, I, I think there, uh, there were things that were done uh, by uh, members of that government that were designed to attempt to come to grips with the, uh, the issue of money laundering in casinos. Derek, do you have a follow-up? Sure. Um, I, can you also um, comment on why the RCMP, why you say the RCMP w were underplaying money laundering in British Columbia for, for those years? Sorry, for, for what? I, I missed your last... Not for, for not investigating, um, not, not investigating um, money laundering the way they should have. The commissioner uses the word underplaying. I, I think he finds that there was a lack of priority and a lack of resources um, dedicated to the investigation of and, and ultimately fight against money laundering by law enforcement in this province for a significant period of time. All right. We'll come back to the room now. We hear from Jason Proctor, CBC. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned a little while ago uh, there was a failure of will. I think you called it. What, from your experience and, and from the evidence that you saw, what can you speak a bit more about that? What the origins of that failure of will f are, so that you know the current governments can can learn from that? I suppose. Well, um, I don't know that I can. Um, I, I'm just describing the the um, the effect uh, of. A, a, uh, in action over a period of time in the face of um, in the face of um, um, significant concern about uh, dirty money entering the, the casino industry and um, I, I don't think I can tell you what the wellsprings of that are I, I can tell you what I uh, observed through the evidence I mean I guess it, it leads to sort of the question of it, it, there was a there's money flowing in, there's, I guess, a certain joy in seeing money go into the coffers. I mean, is, is that part of, of what causes a failure of will, I suppose, in terms of how deeply do you want to look into something that's going to ultimately possibly cost you? And, and how does that fit into the story of money laundering generally? I think the, the commissioner discusses a number of sort of origins of a, a lack of action that, that occurred in this province over a number of years. In some respects, it was a lack of understanding. In some respects, it was a lack of um, resourcing. In some respects, especially on the part of law enforcement, it was a, a failure, to, and, and other agencies, a failure to prioritize. You know, when you speak about the, the money flowing in and nothing being done about it, I assume you're, you're speaking of the casino industry, and the commissioner does identify that there were a number of hallmarks that obviously disclosed a substantial amount of those funds uh, to be highly suspicious and, in fact, illicit in nature. Our next question comes from the phone lines. We hear from Bob Mackin, Breaker News. I don't want to interrupt Mr. Mackin, but uh, I don't know if I can be heard. It's Brock Martland, Commission Counsel, and I was going to pick up on an aspect of Jason's question, if I might. Absolutely. Please go ahead, Brock. Thank you. Um, so part of the question about failures, in my mind, when one then turns to look to the future, and I think the report addresses this, is to say, uh, and the Commissioner in his opening remarks a few moments ago referred to the concept of, of money laundering being uh, for a long time not the focus and not the subject of public uh, and, and regulatory and law enforcement attention. And one of the things to deal with that problem is the, one of the signal recommendations in the report is the creation of an anti-money laundering commissioner and that office would be in a position to ensure with including with public reporting on a regular basis uh, that, that that there isn't a similar failure of the will it, it, that it's not a topic that is up on the agenda this year but slides down the agenda in two or four years from now that there's a consistent uh, and an exclusive focus on this topic thank you thank you we now go to the phones to hear from bob mackin breaker news bob please go ahead Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, a question for, for Brock Marland and Commissioner uh, Cullen. Um, the Commission wasn't able to hold the federal government accountable, but municipalities are creatures of the provincial government. 
Um, why weren't any current or former mayors, councillors, chiefs of staff, bureaucrats from Vancouver and Richmond called to testify? And on the same token, uh, Paul King Jin's lawyer was a participant, but you didn't call Paul King Jin to testify. You didn't hear from any real estate developers. Uh, Premier Horgan himself, he's a former casino lobbyist. We didn't hear from him. That's a long list of, of people that weren't heard from. Can you explain your reasoning for not uh, going to those people and, and calling them to testify? I'll uh, try, Bob, to take an answer, and, and I suspect you'll get an upgrade when the commissioner answers. Um, I think from a commission council point of view, uh, as, as we worked our way collectively to figure out what evidence to lead and where to focus, um, although it did take a long time to do all of this work and run these hearings and put forward the evidence, on the other hand, uh, I don't think we pretended ever that we'd be perfectly comprehensive and without taking a decade and costing much, much more, uh, we couldn't be comprehensive. So uh, I think the commissioner's approach to this was to focus on areas where there are identified uh, risks and concerns and then to make decisions about where to lead evidence, where there was evidence pointing to particular periods of time with a higher risk or higher set of concerns. That was uh, generally where we focused our attention and we did make judgment calls, if you will, in terms of uh, who would be brought in as witnesses and, and where the attention uh, fell. I don't disagree that there are, you've named a few people, I'm not speaking about them specifically, but no doubt a list of others who people would uh, have wanted to hear from. But the nature of the inquiry is that we're balancing trying to be informed and give uh, the public the benefit of the commissioner's analysis and recommendations, but also to get the job done and not to let it go adrift and not to take 10 years. Yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, uh, Brock, that um, part of um, <clears throat> what we were attempting to do was bring the commission in more or less on time and more or less on budget uh, and not uh, plunge down, um, I'm, I'm gonna use the term rabbit holes, I don't mean these are, are simply rabbit holes, but uh, plunge down areas that are going to get us caught up in, in um, uh, much more uh, um, activity than we want to. Um, at, but one of the reasons that I've recommended the uh, anti-money laundering commissioner is, is really to serve that purpose on an ongoing basis. Uh, so that person can look at, um, at uh, the very things that you're talking about Mr. Mackin, including municipal governments and, and uh, other agencies uh, that are um, at, at play in, in, in uh, this area. Bob, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. Um, you didn't really need 10 years. Uh, your commission spent only three years. Maybe four years would have been more suitable, like the Charbonneau Commission in Quebec, that lasted four years. Um, unlike the Charbonneau Commission, uh, it doesn't appear that you recommended any charges. Uh, and I also note that the province regulates securities, but the Commission really didn't go down the road to look at money laundering and fraud in markets. And there's several British Columbians right now who are facing charges in the U.S. for fraud and money laundering. And BC has a long history of fraud and money laundering in stock markets. Why did you shy away from that big money area? Fair to say the Commission shied away from anything. The Commission identified areas of most significant concern and opportunity for the province and led evidence on those and the Commissioner has analyzed those and made recommendations. You refer to um, a lack of recommendation for the charges and that is just simply not what a Provincial Commission is about. A Commissioner, Provincial Commissioner is not, it would be inappropriate for a Provincial Commissioner to make findings of civil or criminal liability. His job is to fulfill his mandate. Uh, which is to conduct an investigation and analysis of the evidence that is before him with a view to making recommendations to the province to address uh, the problems identified or the issues identified in terms of reference. Now we'll come back to the room for our final two questions. First of the two is Graham Wood, Glacier Media. Graham, please go ahead. Hi. Um, we heard about how lottery officials took big bonuses and we're talking about how there's a failure of will. Um, can you elaborate on, did you figure out why there was a failure of will? Well, I, I think um, 
there was a, a period of, of uh, ambiguity and uncertainty about um, what this money was, where it was coming from. And uh, until it, it crystallized into, into certainty in the, in the summer of 2015, uh, there was there was a um, a lack of will to deal with it. Uh, I, I I think that's the best uh, answer I can give you there. Um, so h how do you prove corruption other than bags of cash transacting? You know how how do you prove like how do you determine what corruption is and how do you prove it and how do you how do you come to that determination? I think in the context of this inquiry, the commissioner was looking to see. Uh, it, it, when looking for corruption, whether there was a failure to act or some action that was taken to facilitate money laundering uh, in order to obtain a personal benefit, whether that be financial, political or otherwise. And, and it, through a, a, a fairly thorough investigation, while he found failures, he did not find they were motivated by a corrupt purpose. So the, you know, talking about how government coffers were, you know, plumped up through this uh, activity. Was that not a political gain on the part of the politicians in terms of speaking and in, in the in relation to uh, the failure of will? The commissioner has identified a failure of will that failed to prevent illicit cash from contributing to the province's revenue, uh, but he does not find that any of the inactions or failures were motivated by a corrupt purpose on the part of any of the individuals he discusses. And our final question today comes from Amelia Macauer, CBC Radio Canada. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I was just wondering uh, regarding the whole uh, corruptions of politicians, uh, especially Mr. Coleman and Mrs. Clark. Um, with everything that Dave said, uh, and you said that there was no indication of a personal gain, so this is why there was no uh, indication of corruption, but how do you, in your uh, report, in your investigation, how did you prove that there was no uh, personal gain there? Like, how do we, what evidence did you have to, to prove that? The Commissioner was directed in his terms of reference to determine whether any action or inaction was motivated by corruption. As he indicated in his opening comments, the Commission conducted a thorough investigation, thousands of hours of investigation, interviews, um, examination of extensive documentation, almost 200 days of hearings where, where, or pardon me, almost 200 witnesses heard from over 130 or 40 days of hearings. And throughout all of that, um, the, there was no evidence that the Commissioner identified that supported a finding of a corrupt purpose on, a, on the part of those officials you've, you've identified. Solely based on hearsay, like testimony, or is there actual factual proof that um, they didn't have a hand in anything? It's always difficult to prove a negative, and, and the commission is is not about proving or disproving anything. It's an inquisitorial process, where the job of the commission uh, council and ultimately the commissioner is to get at the truth. Uh, so there was a thorough inquiry done. And, and the findings of the commissioner in that regard are set out in, in his report. Just checking, Brock, do you have anything to add before we wrap? I actually did on that last point, and I know it's hard to interject when I'm by phone. Um, in terms of the questions about corruption, that is part, the, the terms of reference for this commission directed the commissioners to uh, examine that question and make findings. We conducted investigations to look precisely for evidence of that nature. The report speaks to that, the executive summary speaks to that and says there was no corruption and I hear in some of the questions maybe a note of disappointment but maybe I'm reading into it but I would have thought it's a good thing that a process like this leads to a conclusion that even after looking for it, there wasn't corruption. But of course, readers will be the judge as they look at the report. And I know it's easy to say read an 1800 report, but there is a lot of detail. There's a lot more than we're able to cover in this sort of a back and forth. And I would encourage people to read through particular sections to have the uh, exact words of the commissioner. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. That concludes the availability.